In a railway yard in Vienna, a dilapidated boxcar sits silent and rusty. Most who pass by don't even notice the old relic. It seems insignificant and is easily overlooked. For a man from America, however, the unsightly boxcar marks the end of a quest. Jack Nortman has been searching for just such a car. He knows it has a story to tell, and he is determined to bring that story to light thousands of miles away in his hometown of Naples, Florida. The boxcar's ultimate destination is the Holocaust Museum of Southwest Florida, where it will be employed as a moving and most effective educational tool. This is the end of the journey Jack Nortman has long envisioned. For me, the boxcar symbolizes the Holocaust. It symbolizes the inhumanity of dealing with people, treating them like cattle with no regard to respect. I think having a boxcar tells the story. You look at it, you know what it is, and it symbolizes what happens today. To understand the end of the boxcar's journey, it's necessary to look back at the events that led to its construction and its eventual horrific use. The 1920s had seen the establishment of the Deutsche Reichsbahn Gesellschaft, a state-owned national railway company. Its initial aim was to earn profits to help pay the steep war reparations imposed by the Treaty of Versailles. With Hitler's rise to power, the Nazis essentially took control of the DRG. At first, the Nazis appeared to view the railway system as a means to promote Hitler's call for a national reawakening. Germans were encouraged to tour and appreciate their country. To this end, deluxe railroad cars were developed offering comfort and luxury modern electric and diesel trains were introduced and lines were expanded. The system became a model of efficiency. As Hitler's plans to extend Germany's power solidified, however, the railway came to be seen as an integral part of both the war effort and the purification of the Aryan race. In March 1938, Germany annexed Austria. No shots were fired and the invading troops were welcomed with cheers. Shortly afterward, the Austrian Federal Railway was integrated into the Reichsbahn. A similar scenario occurred as Hitler annexed the Sudetenland and all of Czechoslovakia, although the crowds there were not so welcoming. While the annexations were increasing German territory, Hitler and the Nazis were taking steps to control the undesirable elements of the population. The strictest measures targeted Jews. The 1935 Nuremberg race laws stripped German Jews of their citizenship and civil rights. They were barred from working in the government, at newspapers, or as artists. They were not allowed in certain buildings and parks, and they had to wear Jewish stars on their clothing. In November 1938, violence against the Jews segued from isolated incidents to a coordinated plan. Kristallnacht. The night of broken glass targeted synagogues and Jewish businesses throughout Germany, Austria, and Czechoslovakia. There was an organized pogrom persecution. The Nazis said it was a spontaneous reaction to the killing of a diplomat in Paris, but it was truly organized because on one night, all over Germany, the synagogues were burned. Jewish businesses destroyed. One of those was ours. Our apartment above the business was totally destroyed. Jews were arrested and beaten. In the aftermath of Kristallnacht, Jews were forbidden to attend school and banned from most public places. Curfews were established and fines were levied for synagogue rubble that wasn't cleared away. All Jewish businesses were Aryanized, handed over to non-Jewish Germans and the Gestapo rounded up 30,000 Jewish men and women. The men were taken to Dachau, Buchenwald, and Sachsenhausen concentration camps that had been established during the early days of Hitler's reign to house political opponents. 
The camps were situated near quarries and brickyards so that inmates could easily be used as slave labor. When the Nazis invaded Poland in September of 1939, new camps were built in the occupied country, always near rail lines. The Polish railways were incorporated into the Reichsbahn, and the growing system carried troops and supplies to the Eastern Front. It would also eventually transport millions to their deaths. This was a story familiar to Jack Nortman. His parents had endured the horrors of transport in a boxcar. Fortunately, they survived the Holocaust and made their way to America. Nortman and the other Holocaust Museum board members wanted to illustrate the stories of the millions who perished using an authentic boxcar as a teaching tool. The boxcar had to be transported to the port of Rotterdam by truck, but the initial route had to be changed when it was discovered it was too tall to pass under certain bridges. Special permits also had to be secured to pass through the various countries. The boxcar was finally loaded onto a freighter in Rotterdam. The voyage to Miami took about six weeks. Nortman took his mother to witness the arrival. It was a very chilling trip. It was a combination of a lot of sorrow because we knew what that boxcar represented and happiness that we were getting it for the museum and we'd be able to use it as a learning tool. There were a lot of mixed emotions. Especially for Nortman's mother, who joined the group going to Miami to meet the boxcar. We were amazed that the uh, state of Florida, from the governor's office down to the state troopers, wanted to participate in getting the boxcar to Naples. Uh, the state troopers and the local police gave us a police escort. It was really an honor that everybody participated and felt it was so important. Uh, it was exciting, we were delighted. I remember we were going down Alligator Alley at, uh, beyond the speed limit. When we arrived at the border of Collier County, we had the sheriff, police waiting for us with sirens and motorcycles and lights. When we entered Naples, the Naples police joined us. Uh, they took the boxcar, uh, escorted it right down Tamiami Trail, the main road in Naples, uh, in the middle of rush hour, blocked off every street. And then when we got in front of the museum, it was so emotional. As the Nazis extended their reach to Western Europe, Jews were rounded up, forced onto trains and boats, or on very long marches, and sent east to ghettos in Warsaw, Lubin, Lodz, and other Polish and Ukrainian cities. In Kelsa, the establishment of the ghetto took place the week before Passover. In 1940, there was a roundup in the city. Uh, the roundup was by the SS. They picked up young men, a neighbor of ours, two girls pointed at our house and uh, called to the SS Yude that we lived there. And an SS man with a machine gun came into the, to our house, took my, me and my two brothers, didn't take my father. It, they took us to the Jewish synagogue, was the assembly place. There were about 800 people over there assembled. We were there three days and then they took us to the train. When they took us to the box cars and closed the doors and the little windows, it was hard to breathe. It was uh, July, very hot outside, and inside it was probably 120, 130 degrees inside the box car. In order to breathe, we had to lay down on the floor when there were cracks. It was a bad experience. As eastbound trains were bringing Jews to the ghettos, westbound trains were transporting ethnic Ukrainians, Hungarians, and others to Germany to work as slaves at munitions and armament factories. Once again, boxcars served as the means of transport. Anatole Kurdzik was just seven years old when he was shipped out with his parents. They were just taking people out and taking them to say, they begin starting to call us, you know, Osterbeiter. 
which were workers from the East who were going to be taken to Germany and work. No, no threat implied of any kind whatsoever, but you were going to be taken to work. Well, what can you do? I mean, there, there's uh, nothing you could do. And uh, they loaded us on, uh, in the freight cars. For the Jews, however, there was an even more chilling possibility than forced labor and starvation. As World War II entered its waning years, Hitler's final solution was put into effect, and the transports became death rides to the concentration camps equipped with gas chambers, Treblinka, Kelnau, Sobobor, Belzic, and Auschwitz-Birkenau. I don't know if they did that on purpose, but it's ironic that when we left Holland in the middle of the summer, we were in closed cattle cars, and now we're in the midst of the winter in eastern Poland, where it's very cold, and we're in open cattle cars. No food, we used to eat the snow. We were standing, we could, there was no place to sit down, or too many people in a cattle car to sit down. Well, if you had to go to the bathroom, you had to straddle the boxcar. There was no food, you ate snow. As people died, you took coat off and they were thrown overboard. As the Russians closed in on Auschwitz-Birkenau, the Germans began transferring prisoners to camps further west. One such prisoner was Lily Jacob, who was transferred to Dora in the north of Germany. As American forces advanced, the German guards left, leaving many of the prisoners sick with typhus. Lily was one of those prisoners. Found unconscious on the floor, American soldiers moved her to a room formerly occupied by a German soldier. When she awoke, Lily went looking for something to keep her warm. She opened a drawer of a dresser and discovered a book of photos. The first picture she saw was of her rabbi. Looking further, she came upon a photo of her two younger brothers, as well as one of herself and a group of women selected for a work detail. These were the last images of her family that she would ever see. Lily kept what is now known as the Auschwitz album. The Auschwitz album is the only surviving visual record of the process of arrivals and selection. The only thing not recorded is the actual killings. The photos were taken at the end of May or the beginning of June 1944. Early summer was the apex of the deportation of Hungarian Jewry. For this purpose, special rail lines were extended from the railway station outside the camp to a ramp inside Auschwitz. Many of the photos were taken on this ramp of death. Even today, the remains of the camp seem to carry the sense of tragedy. The arriving Jews were taken from the boxcars. Men and older boys are separated into one column. Women and young children are separated into another. All are marched down the ramp to a selection point. Older women and those with young children are selected for extermination, although they are unaware of their coming fate. Young, healthy women are selected for work camps and sent off for de-lousing to have their heads shaved and to be tattooed. The infamous Joseph Mengele was in charge of the selection process. He did the selection, you go here, you go there, you go here. I remember my friend's mother went on this side and I said, why don't you come here to us? I told her and she said, no, 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 we're going to work, we're going to work. That's what he told them, that they're going to work. And, uh, and, uh, the whole thing was a lot of bull. Lie on lie on lie. Clothing and possessions were gathered and brought to an area of the camp known as Canada. There they were sorted for storage or transport. Even the hair cut from the gassed women's heads were bundled in bales 
and sent back to Germany to be processed into insulating material. The same trains that brought the prisoners to the camps and to their deaths made the return trip packed with all their remaining worldly goods. It was called Canada, like, like uh, the other part of America, north to, to United States, Canada. What, what it meant for us to sort out the wardrobe that came from the Hungarian transport. This was the time that the trains are coming and unloading people from uh, Budapest or other Hungarian cities. And those people were dressed well because they didn't know where they're going. So they had in the hem of their coats, they had uh, sewed in money or uh, jewelry or whatever. German people knew that. So they created a special unit of people that they will look for the jewelry, for the money. As the tide of the war turned against Germany, the Nazis stepped up the pace of killing at the camps. When the Allies finally arrived and liberated the camps, they could hardly believe the sights that greeted them. Piles of bodies and thousands of people shrunk to mere shadows of their former selves. My father was six foot one when we were liberated by George Patton's Third Armored Division after they came through the Battle of the Bulge. Uh, Papa weighed 138 pounds. So you can just imagine bones covered with skin. The atrocities of the concentration camps were so horrific, so beyond belief, that they're difficult to imagine when they found rows of boxcars containing bodies of sick and murdered inmates. Hearing the stories from those who experienced them helps bring them to life. So too do artifacts like the Holocaust Museum's boxcar. But before the boxcar could be employed as an effective educational tool, it needed to be completely refurbished. That task fell to Gary Fusco, owner of the woodworker's cabinet, who offered assistance as soon as he heard about the boxcar. And I just said, I'm in. I said, I'll do, I said, I'll do whatever I can. I said, and I'd like to, I'd like to offer our facility. I said, we have, we have a place right outside our, our, our building where we could actually store it, because I know that'll be a problem. Where do we work on it? I said, we have all the tools, everything is right there. The first challenge was getting the boxcar into position at the cabinet shop. The area where the boxcar was located outside of the wood shop that, where we worked on the boxcar was a very tiny space, difficult to even back a truck into. The crane operators were able to get this thing in with minimal effort, set it down safely on blocking, we were able to do our work, and they were able to get it out the same way. If I had to do this myself, it's, it would seem like a daunting, almost impossible task. With the car in position, Fusco and Sabin Fine, his foreman on the restoration project, began assessing what needed to be done. Damage from rot and rust was extensive. And so we realized that we would have to completely take the car apart because they want, their whole purpose was to leave it outside. If this was going to be staying inside in a, in a museum, in an air-conditioned museum, it would last, you know, it would last another hundred years. But the fact that they wanted to keep it outside in this heat and humidity and salt air, I said it'll last maybe a year. Fine and his crew took the entire car apart, labeling each piece so it could be put back in the proper place when the time came. We had to not only preserve the location of all the wood on the boxcar and document that, we also had to assess what boards were repairable and what boards were not. We were trying to maintain the integrity of the wood at the same time, keep the percentage of the original wood intact as best we could. In order to do that, we found a process to repair the damaged wood using a plastic, a two-part resin epoxy plastic that is in, is in liquid state and turns into solid state within a minute. And by making molds, we were able to repair 
I would say a good 85% of the uh, problems in the wood. While the structural integrity of the metal frame was good, there was considerable rust and the paint was peeling badly. A sandblaster was used to remove the rust from the metal. The frame was then primed and painted. When all the old and new wood and metal was ready, the process of reassembly began. First, all of the exterior boards, and then the floorboards, each going back to its original position as recorded during the initial dismantling. During the restoration, the crew discovered markings that dated the boxcar to the 1920s. That discovery led to the decision to make the car look as it would have during the 1940s. To that end, a faux finisher was brought in to age the wood and metal that now looked too new. Even the exterior metal was made to look as if it was rusting. The entire project took several months of painstaking work, but for those involved, it became a labor of devotion. Now it was time to remove the boxcar from Fusco's shop and move it to the historic Naples train depot for the dedication ceremony. Again, a crane had to slowly raise it past utility poles and gently lower it onto a low boy. After traveling the streets of Naples, it arrived at the depot and was once again lowered into place. For the first time, it was mated to the axles and wheels that had been a part of it for many decades. The reactions that people have to the boxcar were clearly evident at the dedication ceremony. Holocaust survivors were naturally overcome with emotion. At least, thanks to my son, people will know they're not going to forget. Because some people, they don't believe it could happen. I myself can't believe it this was what I've been through. But even those whose lives had not been touched directly by the Holocaust were moved and affected. From the very beginning of the boxcar's journey, the directors of the Holocaust Museum envisioned using it as an educational tool. But they wanted to do more with it than simply have it open for students and others who were visiting the museum to explore. We made a decision that we were gonna, instead of having the kids and the schools come to the museum and see the boxcar, that we were gonna do something that was never been done in the world. We were gonna send a boxcar to the schools. Implementing that plan required some tricky and challenging coordination between the museum, Southwest Florida political and school officials, and local transport companies. The boxcar has made a huge impact um, in all aspects of education at the Holocaust Museum. And um, it's a program that was very difficult to put together because how do you figure out how to take a 10 ton <laughs> antique boxcar around Southwest Florida? And honestly, it was not a project that I wanted to do um, when it first started. And now I can't imagine not doing it. It's been one of the biggest highlights of our educational programming. There is no doubt that the Holocaust was a horror almost unimaginable. There is no doubt that getting even just a small sense of the terrors by being in the boxcar can be immensely moving. But calling forth such emotions is important to the future of humanity. Six million Jews died during the Holocaust. So did another five million non-Jews. The main mission of the Holocaust Museum is to bring this uncomfortable history to light so that future generations will be motivated to prevent such an immense horror from happening again. I think that the strength and beauty of what the Holocaust Museum here is doing is taking in a very real way those words never again and putting them into action in a way that students from 18 to even as young as 10 or 11 can understand what it is that we're talking about. And it's not something that just happened 
a long time ago in history books that they saw pictures of, but it's something that hap is happening right now. And that lonely boxcar has come full circle, completing an incredible journey of redemption. From its humble origins and through its employment as a conveyor of death, it too has come into the light. Rescued and restored by dedicated and caring hands, it now helps in teaching a horror of the past so that hope and tolerance can grow in its tracks, just as Anne Frank envisioned in her diary. If God lets me live, I will make my voice heard. I will work in the world and for mankind.